Greetings and welcome to Starkville, now part of the Athletic Baseball Show, where you'll find great baseball talk all week long and all spring training long. I'm Jason Stark. I write about baseball for the Athletic, and I'm joined once again by my good friend, writer, broadcaster, professor, distinguished former major leaguer, and the voice of Sunday Night Baseball for ESPN Radio, Doug Glanville. So, Doug. We got spring training covered. I'm in Florida. You took a little tour of Arizona. Uh, What did spring training look like from your vantage point? Yeah, well, it's great baseball. I I, first of all, this was my first uh, experience of watching the new rules in play. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. So that was that was cool. The games were crisp. Uh, I got (laughs) to see the Brewers. I got to see the White Sox. I got to see the Cubs. The Dodgers beautiful facilities it's a uh, you know a little different than uh my playing days are <laughs> these these places as as mark derosa said at team usa in between innings he said uh he's at the giants complex when they played the giants and he said wow what's the motivation of these young guys to get out of there <laughs> these places are so nice <laughs> so um yeah it's a different day but i i had a good time a long flight back i had a three over three hour layover in charlotte but uh, that's why I'm kind of delirious. I had no sleep, but that's all right. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. So, we Like, we don't travel well. That's a whole other story. No. Red eye, um, three-hour layover. So that doesn't work yeah. too well. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've noticed we got a lot going on in our sport. Uh, so our special guest this week is mm-hmm. our friend Eduardo Perez of ESPN and a mm-hmm. big part of Team Puerto Rico. Um, nothing better than talking to Eduardo about the WBC and – whatever else we can get to in baseball. Um, I bet you thought his team threw a perfect game on Monday, huh? (laughs) Not so fast. Uh, We'll get into that shortly. Um, But first, you know, I've spent my whole spring, Doug, watching baseball played with these new rules. And man, I I mean, you see stuff every day, like literally every day, there's something you say you've never seen before. So uh, why don't we talk about some of that stuff? I've got a big column uh, in The Athletic about what we've seen in the first two weeks so far. Uh, Just some basic facts you need to know. Um, As of when I wrote that piece, the games were 25 minutes shorter than last year. 25 minutes. Uh, Offense was up, and teams have been trying to steal bases this spring at a rate that we have not seen in the big leagues since, are you ready? 1919. So, uh, Doug, you saw these rules in action. Just curious, just in general, what you thought? Well, the first thought is just the the tempo. <clears throat> you know, that was the the objective, the Christmas of the game, the ball. It's just moving. It's moving. And, you know, as a color analyst, it's a little bit tricky at first to figure out, like, well, can I jump in here? Because the pitch, the guy's right back on the mound. And, you, you know, your storytelling is more when, like, dead time when number 97 is in the game or something like that, or which won't happen in the regular season, by the way, (laughs) and uh, foul balls, you know, some, some other delays, but it's not the, it's not the game that's delaying it anymore. It's, it's the, it's the other things that are, you know, are supposed to be the delays of foul balls and, you know, pitcher goes out to the mound, catcher goes out to the mound, uh, those kind of things. So I, I thought it was great. I thought it was, you know, these games were two and a half hours, two hours, 15 minutes. It was just like crisp and moving, and I, you know, I, I enjoyed it just uh, on a fan level, even as I was calling the game. I went to the Dodgers Cubs game, wasn't even working, and I loved that. I just sat in and sat with Charlie Steiner and Tim Kirchin and just kind of took it all in. And uh, yeah, and I remember talking to Charlie for a minute, turned back, and I'd missed like two outs or something like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had to, I had to cheat off the guy, you know, the paper next door, be like, hey man, what what happened to this? I I think I heard the ball get hit. So it, it's just. It's just a different, almost a different game. And I think the other thing is the respect that the players have for it so quickly. I know, you know, tradition and time and clocks, but players seem to be really embracing coaches and they're they're actually looking at themselves. Eric Hosmer was saying, it's like, man, I I um, you know, I'm I gotta I'm getting in trouble. I gotta cut down on these violations. Like they're motivated <laughs> to kind of keep up with it. So uh I, I I think that's like sort of my my quick look at it. And yeah, I'd love to go into some of these rules specifically because there's there's so much I've observed from that. 
Yeah, well, players have no choice. They've got yes. to adjust. And it means, you know, like reprogramming their brains, uh, changing their routines. I, you know, one of the things I wrote about that people seem amazed by was, as I watched these games early on, I noticed hitters never adjusted their batting gloves anymore. Um, <laughs> and I so one day I thought, I, this is the, the, probably the goofiest thing I've ever done, but I'm going to watch during this game and count how many times the batting gloves get adjusted. And it was two times the whole game. What what was it last year? A thousand? <laughs> like, so what does that tell us, Doug, that people have been able to give up adjusting, tightening those batting gloves? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, I, I'd like tight, tight gloves. I did. Uh, I don't think I spent like, you know, no more Garcia power on a time on it, but uh, yeah, I, I, it's uh to me, the, the, the global picture with four kids who are still teenagers and under, it feels like a giant experiment of helicopter parenting. I mean, that that's kind of what we're looking at here. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know, visiting the mound, you know, first of all, like, I can relate. The guys go hit and then they're looking at the iPads. I'm always battling my kids, get off the screens. And I know, I know Freddie Freeman was offended last year on how much guys would go hit and then not watch the game and just look at their iPad. That's the battle I'm probably going to have today because they have a snow day. So that's just right off the top of my head. And then on top of it, it's like the clock thing. Like, you know, let's go. Like, that's me waking up one of my daughters every morning. Like, come on, let's, you got to go. You know what time it is? If you see me up here in my jacket, that means that you only have 25 minutes to get to school. I was just up here three times before. Like that, that's kind of what the clock management feels like. So I, I, you know, so I think they're gone into another level of parenting. You know, you have to visit the mound more. You have to talk to people, you know, I, I, so I, I get it. And since, you know, baseball skews a little bit older, most people, these fans 50 and older, they're, they're probably parents, a lot of them. Uh, so I think they've captured the essence of parenting. Uh, and I, I don't know if that's a great marketing tool, but it certainly works for me. <laughs> okay. I don't know if Rob Manfred thought that, that is what he was doing, but I, I can see where you're going with it. Um, l- l- let me just tell you about a couple of things that, uh, that I've run across. Um, you remember our last show, Gary Cohen was on, great Mets broadcaster, and he was telling us how Buck Showalter was thinking he needed to take his best bat boy on the road. <laughs> we thought that was hilarious, but here's why Buck, as always, has <laughs> been out in front of the rest of the planet in thinking about everything. Here's a thing that really happened in a game last week. This was Tigers twins. So uh, Riley Green of the Tigers hits a double. So he gets the second base, and now he's got to peel off all the, the shin guards and all the stuff. And the bat boy comes strolling out, grabs the stuff. Bat boy kind of takes his time getting off the field. <laughs> Javi Baez is on deck, and he's waiting, he's waiting, and he's waiting for the bat boy to get off the field. And he steps into the box, and as he's <laughs> digging into the box, what happens? Strike one. No pitch has been thrown, but it's strike one because the clock was ticking through this whole <laughs> time, and he wasn't in the box yet. So, D- Doug, w- what should we think about moments like this, and what should have happened? Because I know what should have happened. <laughs> well, that that is the part that's interesting. Like, well, first of all, hitters just have to sprint to the box, and and it. It's kind of weird, but it feels like you have to be in the box in the statue form, and then all the stuff could be going on around you, none of which include the pitcher on the mound. But you got to be ready. You got to be ready. So I mean, now, but of course, Buck. Of course, you have to uh, hire very specific bat boys that understand the clock management and be part of the team. But uh, hitter, first of all, we learned that with the first violation, uh, the the Braves Red Sox game. Yeah, we did. Even though the- even though the catcher was doing all kinds of stuff, you have to ignore, you have to be in a special zone to ignore all these things that normally you would out of respect, give people time. So no longer, you got to just, you got to get in that batter's box batters beware. Yeah. When it like, that is a good rule of thumb when in general, when in doubt, just get in the box and start staring at that picture. Now um, one thing I, I did learn when I inquired about this was if the bat boy is not off the field, they're supposed to reset the clock <laughs> that, that yeah. hasn't always happened. It, you know, they were on the road at the time. Uh, I had a, had a manager say to me, sometimes when I'm on the road, I feel like these clock operators are like Duke going to play at North Carolina. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. so, so there is that part of it. Then, then here's another thing that we were talking about with Gary Cohen, Max Scherzer. Uh, he's Max is running his own lab experiment. Basically, you know, he, he he's, 
pitching so fast that the whole strikeout is over with in under 30 seconds. Uh, we see him hold the ball so long with runners on base that he doesn't even he forgets to start his delivery before the clock hits zero. But the like the the Max Scherzer highlight of the spring was his second start when uh, if you remember this, they're facing the Nationals. Uh, Victor Robles is the hitter. And the like the instant that Victor Robles gets in the box and looks at Max, he delivers the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> so the umpire calls that a balk. Uh, Max disagrees that it's a balk. And so like this prompted this whole um discussion of what to do about this inside major league baseball and they're not fixing these rules trust me they're not but they are tweaking and <laughs> and, and issuing memorandums so I had, a coach tell, I had a coach tell me uh, a couple of days later hey did you hear we've got a max scherzer rule <laughs> okay so well if you were in charge what would the max scherzer rule be doug well i i love that they um uh, they're adjusting this quickly. It kind of was a Harry Potter where they had the, the uh, high inquisitor. Uh, she, she um, put in rules. Uh, oh, decrees. He put in decrees. That's what you have. Yeah. So you have to have decrees that you can put in action very quickly. And therefore Max Scherzer would be one of these decrees and you have spontaneity in these decrees. So Max Scherzer, what would we call it? I don't, I don't know. Mad Max, Mad Max decree one. Uh, but yes, you have to adjust these things. And, and look, I relate to this because Matt, Greg Maddox did this to me. Okay. Like I was always my leading off a game. I would always do my little stretch and all kind of crazy stuff to start the game off. And then I got in the box with one foot and then I got in, I'd shimmy. And, I, and it was just an etiquette understanding. Like you wait for the person to get ready. And now I know it was out of control the last few years, but this particular time I do all that stuff. And as soon as I look up, the ball was actually halfway there. He didn't even let me look at him <laughs> and it was strike one. So I was like, okay. So there was no balk because first of all, there was nobody on base, but it was kind of, you know, it was kind of messed up. I think he knew that, you know, but that's Maddox. Like he's getting in your head. So I 100% get the strategy on this. Uh, so Scherzer, you just have to freeze them. The freeze, you got you to gotta slow them down. <laughs> right. So, well, look, they want the pitchers to work fast. So, Max, thanks for that part. Uh, here's the other part, though. Uh, the Max Scherzer rule, uh, as I understand it, is that uh, from now moving forward, uh, yes, the hitter – has to be in the box and what is the terminology alert to the pitcher, but <laughs> he also has the right to get set in the box. Like he can't just be kind of glancing at the pitcher. Right? So if, if that doesn't happen, uh, the umpires have now been authorized to call time. They can warn the pitcher. Don't do that. Uh, if he keeps doing it, then it's a violation. It's a balk or a ball, depending on whether a runner's on base. All right, one more fun thing that I thought that we, this was really fun. I, I noticed this. You know, I'm watching every pitch uh, closer than I've ever watched spring training ever before. So I was writing a story on Kevin Godsman of the Blue Jays and how they've basically told him his delivery is now illegal. So I'm watching him. He's pitching against the Rays. It's a really windy day. And Doug... I, I I thought I saw him blow off the mound. <laughs> so now he comes out of the game um, and he talks, you know, during the game, during spring training, you get to talk to these players during the game. So he's talking to the Toronto media, but also me. And so I'm, I'm waiting to all the Toronto beat writers kind of ask their questions. <laughs> I had a question and I said, did you blow off the mound at one point? <laughs> and he said, <laughs> Yeah, I did. Uh, he said, I'm lucky there was six seconds to go on the clock. And they, I was lucky that the clock operator reset it. And I said, they did reset it, but I'm not sure that's what happened. I think maybe the umpire did that. So afterwards, um, I went to the clock operator and asked him if he reset it. And he said, no, the uh, the umpire gave a signal. Um, and that's how that's why we reset it. So I, I texted Kevin Gosman afterwards and said, just so you know, um, uh, the umpire was the one who made that call to reset the clock. And he, he texted me back and he said, good to know. So in the future, <laughs> when in doubt, act like it's windy. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so I thought, yeah, that's a really good plan, Kevin. I don't think they'll even notice you're pitching in a dome. 
<laughs> right, you're right indoors. <laughs> it's like, oh, so, I tripped. It was just an amusing oh, yeah. little uh, little incident there. Um, it, it just the umpires do have discretion to stop that clock. Uh, that's not always a good thing. That's got a potential to be a really controversial thing at some point. But I think in general, uh, in this instance, it was a really good thing. Uh, Doug, yeah. just the, the the moral of the story is this clock is going to give us so much material for this show. I don't know about you. I'm there for all of it. Yeah. And, uh, well, and, and as they promised, they were going to be extreme in spring training. And I think you'll see you know, some like adjustments to, for the season, but I just want to get everybody into the habit. And, and in your column, you talk about like, they're getting, a, they're adjusting, you know, they're just getting used to it and there's less violations. So they want to just get the culture right and then right. let it go. And, and I think, you know, you know, and one fascinating thing, you know, just briefly on the shift is when I was watching it, I was thinking that, okay, there's, you know, two guys on each side on the dirt. I think the, on the dirt thing is a bigger deal than, than, than I first thought. Because right. they don't they don't have the angles anymore, and I, I saw f- at least four base hits in one of the games that were hit like th- three feet to the left of the second baseman, and he had no time because it was like a hundred t- you know off the bat. So I think that is going to be really interesting if because just by playing deeper, even if they said fine, two guys on each side, but you can play at any depth, then that if you have the depth ability, the ability to be deeper like you were last year, you would cut off all these balls. So I was amazed how many balls were hit like close to them. They're just not used to that, you know, that first step, like Scott Rowland, like, boom, you got to go. So I, I thought that was fascinating about the shift. I, I was looking about, the, you know, thinking about the three guys being the big factor, which it is, but it's also the two guys and not being able to be deep to create angles. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, that's really true. Also, you know, these infielders that are used to, you know, you set up on the grass and then you take a step forward onto the dirt. That's like, can't do that anymore either. Uh, so it's really messing with these players in a lot of different ways. But uh, everybody just understands this is the deal. It's going to happen. They're not going to give us any slack. So we better figure it out. All right, Doug, time to welcome in our very special guest this week. He's our good friend. Not to mention your ESPN Sunday night teammate and a big part of and a big fan of Team Puerto Rico in the WBC. It's the one, the only, Eduardo Perez. Eduardo, thanks to you for fitting us in during uh, an incredibly cool and busy time. It is, but was that your like impersonation a little bit of Howard Cosell with, <laughs> with little Keith Jackson in there as well? I, 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 I got it. it. Do you know what? You're the first person who has noticed that. I've been, I've been doing this for quite a while, like months. Nobody has ever noticed what I was doing there. It was, uh, nice going there. Eduardo Perez does not miss a thing, ladies and gentlemen. He does not. He does not. <laughs> hey, man, can we start with Monday? Because what a night that was for Team Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. The game was amazing. The atmosphere was so special and the ending was so emotional. So we have got to hear it. This is what the ending of this game sounded like. That one is lined into left field base hit. Maldonado and they're going to send him. Here comes the throw. It's cut off. The relay is late and the game is over. Now they knew a walk-off. Perfect game. World Baseball (laughs) Classic win. How cool is that? How cool is that? Uh, what, what do you think, Eduardo? You have goosebumps? Oh, perfect. <laughs> I, I do. I mean, Dave Fleming on the call, first of all. Yeah. Um, and then it's it's kind of sort of, you know, you look back and you're like, Maldonado's probably one of the slowest runners in the game. And he's at second base. And you have Kike Hernandez, who has yet to get a hit in spring training, yet he's doing well in the World <laughs> Baseball Classic. But he'll go back to spring training once this is over, hitless. Um, <laughs> right. This is the beauty, the beauty. And I'm wondering if by the next collective bargaining agreement or something like that, are we going to have knockout rules to save pitchers arms as well? Because it was a perfect game for Puerto Rico. It was a perfect night for Puerto Rico. But at the same time, because it wasn't played nine innings, it doesn't go in as a perfect game. Yeah. All right. All right let's, let's, let's start with this. Okay. I, you know, here we thought we had witnessed this team. <laughs> 
uh, led by an incredible start by Jose De Leon. Okay. Uh, looks like he's thrown a perfect game and it ended the way no perfect game had ever ended with a walk-off hit. <laughs> okay, so it means the mercy rule kicks in, game's over after eight innings. And now we've got the Elias Sports Bureau stepping in to say, no, 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 no. That was no, no perfect game because your right. team didn't pitch all nine innings. I don't know about you guys. My reaction was, <laughs> seriously? I mean, hey, this that's... ruling makes no sense to me. I understand why it makes sense during the season, but in this tournament, the rules are different. So shouldn't the standards for what constitutes a perfect game be different? Eduardo, help me. Was that a perfect <laughs> and, game or an imperfect game? And does and does Elias have jurisdiction on international? <laughs> I don't know question. why it should. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I love Elias, but I know what I saw there. Stop getting in the way of the emotion of the moment. Well, he went it was right, he the US, went, By the way, you went to your Harry Callis there. I got that. <laughs> so, I, I'm, I'm feeling. I'm feeling all the stuff you're doing here, uh, Jason. I, I'll tell you this: it was such a perfect night because the fans outside the stadium before the game started, and, and Doug, you know about this at a certain level because you played in Puerto Rico and Mayaguez. But here, it's the people coming from up north. I'm talking New York, trickling down. I met some people from Virginia that lived there, Puerto Ricans, that were in the military. They drove down. I've seen people that live in Orlando, Tampa area. They're driving down just for the game that day. You look at the west side of, uh, of, of uh, the peninsula of Florida. They're doing the same thing from Naples all the way to Port, you know, Port Charlotte and all that. They're trickling down. It is, it's amazing to see an entire stadium with people singing the lyrics of La Borinquena, the national mm -hmm. anthem of Puerto Rico, the just all in unison, all together. We've seen uh, supermodels, Miss Universes, Suleika, <laughs> Suleika Rivera was there uh, as well. You have, uh, you know, reggaeton artists, the, the mm -hmm. Yankee and all these guys just all getting together as one. And it's not that, you know, and they're just, they're going after one thing and they're cheering for one thing. And that's Team Rubio, the blonde kids. And that started in <laughs> 2017 when Yadier Molina told everybody on the team, let's, let's, uh, let's dye our hair. And the entire island did it. The entire island ran out of hair product to dye their hair. They <laughs> ran out of hydroperoxide. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Miss Clairol made a killing just for men kicked ass because that's the reality. <laughs> that's what happened in this time. Puerto Rico stocked up on it. And as a matter of fact, um, they even got into the Guinness World Books of Record with the amount of people that were able to dye their hair in less than one hour in one place. Uh, oh that's God. how much the island is just supporting this team. And now, because of this perfect, imperfect game, <laughs> we have to now go against the Dominican Republic, most likely, if Venezuela wins this afternoon. Um, they have to go against them to see who goes in and who goes home. Wow. And it's going to be standing room only the way it mm. should be at Lone Depot Park. The pool of death. Uh, your team has uh, lost to Venezuela, which is 2-0, and but beaten team Israel. So Tuesday night, epic matchup, Dominican, both teams one and one, both teams need to win. How, how hard is your heart pounding right now? I'm just thinking about <laughs> that game. You know what? It's uh, it, it is. I think everyone's heart is pounding in the Dominican Republic. Everyone's heart is pounding in Puerto Rico. I think it's going to be the biggest crowd Lone Depot Park has ever witnessed. Um, the tickets are 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 hard get right now, and most importantly, this is what the pool of death was about. Um, I love the fact that Venezuela, who a lot of people thought, look, you know, with what they've done in the past in 2017 and 2013. They really didn't show up in the last one, but they're together. They're united. Omar Lopez has done a great job managing that team, using their pitching staff really well. Um, and, you know, Martin Perez, what he did, uh, Luis Garcia coming in after Martin Perez in game one uh, against the Dominican Republic, they neutralized a heck of an offense. I mean, you look at what they were able to do against Team Puerto Rico. Salvador Perez took care of business and made it easy for Pablo Lopez to go out there and dominate. Venezuela took the day off yesterday. They're going to come back against Nicaragua. But this is 
the the craziness of this sport. We saw it in Pool C, where Great Britain went out and pulled the upset against Colombia, right? We can is it Great Britain or Great Britain? We'll talk about that later. <laughs> but but anything can happen in a given day. And if let's say Nicaragua stuns Venezuela after Venezuela beating Puerto Rico in the Dominican, can you imagine that? All of a no. sudden, Venezuela would be two and one. Uh, Puerto Rico is two and one right now. Dominican, most likely tonight they play Israel. They could be two and one. And yeah. it comes down to what happened in Pool A in Chinese Taipei, where all of a sudden it was Cuba winning it after starting their tournament 0 and 2. They finished doing really well 2 and 2, but they won with run differentials with, the, mm-hmm. with their pitching. And their defense and their and John Moncada finally swinging that back. So anything can happen. Mike Piazza is in. They're going. <laughs> you know, they're, they're in. I mean, who would have thought of that? And this could, in a very way, happen here. Even though Nicaragua is already zero and three, this could be the the game that they're like, we're go- we're all in. Let's 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 go for it. So we never know what could happen. Well, you know, Eduardo, I mean, I, I recall the previous World Baseball Classic, you know, Adam Jones catch and all these yeah. moments. But there's also Puerto Rico has just been through a lot, you know, you know, just the, the hurricanes. And I mean, can you connect the dots between the significance of these games and also just like the recovery? You talked about the, the blonde hair, but it's been so much deeper than that about like how the the country has rallied behind these teams and, and the support. Look, so 2017 2017- was what was a, a symbolic year for Puerto Rico. It was a very important year for Puerto Rico. Uh, we, since then, there's been a lot of things from hurricanes, from the Hurricane Maria that devastated the island back then. But we've also had earthquakes in the southern part of Puerto Rico that have, that have um, scared people, that have damaged homes, that have left a lot of people having to relocate. And um, a lot of, you know, a lot of PTSD from, from so many catastrophes that are just mother nature. Uh, also politically, Puerto Rico has struggled with that. Economically, it has struggled as well. So for the people to have something to hold on to, baseball has been able to do it. The World Baseball Classic has been a huge part of it. I'm not, I didn't even include the pandemic. You know, the pandemic, which obviously, you know, it was the entire world that was affected by it, but it was another thing to add on to the people, the resilient people of our island in Puerto Rico. And, all you know, so to be able at that time, I was named the general manager of the team. I knew that we've had success in 2013. I knew that we had success in 2017, getting to the final game. In 2013, it was against the Dominican. 17, it was against the U.S. We fought, we've been really close. And we played with a lot of heart. All of a sudden, we've had to wait longer because of the pandemic. Six years for this moment, the players all wanted to play. I mean, there were players that were left out. Some players like Carlos Correa, his wife just gave birth on the first day of the series. He had to make a tough decision not to play. Jose Miranda gets hurt a week before the tournament starts. You know, you're like, you're missing two big bats in the middle of the order. But one thing you can never take away from Puerto Ricans is the heart that they go out, uh, that, that they play with. And they might not be the most talented on the field, but they are the most resilient on the field. And we've always had a tradition of great catchers in Puerto Rico, starting from mm-hmm. the Diego Sandy Alomar, uh, Ivan Rodriguez, you can keep going and going, Yadier Molina. Uh, so many that we have right now. And right now, Martin Maldonado, having mm-hmm. been behind the plate in this game, showed you what perfection can look like, even though it was just eight innings because of our offense. And there's so much pride. And, and you know, Christian Vasquez, think about it. He was the catcher in the World Series with the perfect game, you know, also with the no-hitter uh, when, uh, when you know, uh, that, that happened there in Philadelphia. And it's the Puerto Rican pride that's behind the plate, the Puerto Rican pride that's, in, that's, that's just in our roots. And for this tournament, we take it personal and everyone um, unites. I'll give you one more thing. In 2017, during the World Baseball Classic, Jason, Doug, 
the crime rate in Puerto Rico, which was very high, was at zero. Was at <laughs> zero during the semifinals and the finals. For an entire mm-hmm. week, there was zero crime in mm-hmm. Puerto Rico. For me, mm-hmm. that tells you the power of baseball. Mm. And, and you know, Eduardo, you're, you're touching on something that it seems like we talk about every time the World Baseball Classic comes around, and that is what it means to people around the world versus what it means to people here, what it means to players from these countries around the world versus what it means to Americans. And how how would you describe that difference? And is there a way to bridge that difference? There's so much pride. I mean, I think it stems from, you know, you look at the Caribbean series. uh, There's always been uh, pride in in winter ball and playing, and then all of a sudden representing your island, uh, representing your nation, representing your flag, most importantly. Uh, and anything that has to do with sports unites all of our countries. And I think it's not only in, in Latin America. We can look all around the world, as you said, where in Chinese Taipei and Taiwan, uh, the fans showed up in a major way. Uh, you look at in Japan, the top players play in Japan. I think Lars Nupar is going to come in with a different perspective of what baseball is in Japan. Um, the starting staff, of the uh, of Team Japan is the best I think right now out there. There's there's and and that says a lot because the Dominican Republic has a heck of a starting staff, but Team Japan, it's no one comes close. And to be able to understand what this means to a country to be able to play against the best, Mike Trout said it best. He saw it in 2017. He was in his club. He was in the clubhouse watching these games. He was at home, and he's like, I can't miss out on the next one. Uh, I just hope that more players, more star players continue to say, yes, I want to play. I'll get ready a little bit earlier than spring training to be able to do so. And it just unites everyone. The Czech Republic is a great story. Mm -hmm. You have firefighters. You have professors. You Mm -hmm. have doctors. That you have a neurosurgeon who's actually the manager of the team, <laughs> is affecting everyone. There's there's going to be a, 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 if I'm not mistaken, it's going to be a, a firefighter that's going to go back home and say, "I struck out Shohei Otani." <laughs> no, I, I mean, how many True. people say that True around? Not be a professional. That's mm-hmm. a movie right there. Um, so so yes, there's there's so much pride. Mike Piazza taking his team. Before spring training in January, we're going to meet in Italy and we're going to practice as a team. And we're going to become a family. And that family moved on from round one. And against all odds, they beat out Netherlands and they moved on to round two in Japan. Now, that's a tough task to ask. They have to go up now against Shohei Otani most likely and beat him. Good luck. But at <laughs> least they're in Japan in round two. And that's what unites baseball to be able to have Great Britain win a game. The Czech Republic present. Italy move over. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Let's put it this way. For the next World Baseball Classic, the Czech Republic doesn't have to qualify. They're in. They are <laughs> in. A great story, China. China, they finished in last. But China has not played professionally in their league since before the pandemic. They have not started up their league again. So those players were practicing amongst themselves, getting ready for this classic. Now they're going to have to qualify again because they finished last in their bracket. Well, Eduardo, I mean, you just, um, you know, I know when I was playing in Puerto Rico, uh, eventually a few years later, there was a lot of like diminishing participation, right? The the league, right. the local league. Now, I'm going to throw this out there that Mayaguez finally won the championship this year. So I'm throwing that out <laughs> there, my old team. But do you, do you see a connection where, getting the revitalization of baseball in Puerto Rico uh, for the league, you know, coming off of this, you know, do you see a possibility of that? And I guess where, where is it now? The answer is no. And, and let me, and I have to be very brutally honest here. I, I played it. I've managed it in the league. I think there's a, there's a lot of good young talent in the league, but there's also a lot of distractions to be had. And the people and the fans will show up for the finals. They will. 
they'll show up all of a sudden and you're like, where were these people? You know, they love a good party. Puerto Rico, you know this, we can party with the best of them. Mm -hmm. um, but the star players, they're not going to play. It's a different era. Uh, mm -hmm. It's different money. Organizations make sure they have to take care of their, their top product. So you're not going to see the elite pitchers that are established, the Edwin Diaz pitch in Puerto Rico. Um, you're not. And that's the reality. And, and it's, uh, it's unfortunate. Now, in the Dominican Republic, you have such a big talent pool that really good players do play and, and they, they show up and it's different. Economically, for the players, it's differently. It's different than it is in Puerto Rico. Now, there are some really good talent that are playing. Uh, Jose De Leon, who's battled a lot of injuries, played this winter in Puerto Rico, did really well. And because of that, uh, he showed that he was healthy and he, and he not only made the team, he threw, he was part of the start of that perfect game, five and a third innings of pitching. If Jose De Leon would have not had and sustained a lot of his injuries, uh, he would have been already a six or seven year veteran in the league. That's how good Jose De Leon was coming up through the Dodger and Tampa Bay organization. But injuries have stopped him. Jaxel Rios, who pitched for Philadelphia as well, did really well this year in winter ball. And he earned a spot on that roster because of how good he was the pitcher of the year down there. And he's been a big impact with, uh, with, uh, with the national team right now as well. But there are ways to use it. There are good players, except I think we have to promote them a little bit better and educate the fans in Puerto Rico and around the world who these young stars are and who are and why are they playing in the island at the moment. You, you know, Eduardo, there's another aspect to the WBC that it just jumps off the screen at you, or if, certainly if you're in the building, you can't miss it. And that's the, the tension and the urgency of every game. It feels like every game is must win. And that's not very baseball-like. You know, is, is there any other baseball experience like this where – Every game is played with that sort of urgency. Plus, you've got the weight of your nation riding on it. Yeah, the only thing I could think of is I had the honor of calling uh, the Olympics um, and this past year in Japan with uh, Jason Benetti. We did it out of the studio in New Jersey. Don't get me wrong. But <laughs> yeah. we still felt that tension that in order to qualify, going into the qualifying rounds, in order to be able to qualify for a medal, all these were not only must-wins, but you had to win by a lot because runs do matter. Run prevention does matter. So those, so even if it's a seven to one game, eight to one game, forget about trying to play and, and you know, and respecting the opponent. No, because you're not only competing against that opponent, you're competing against the potential other opponent of being tied with them. And it comes down to that. So you have to continue to manage. You have to continue to push the button uh, buttons. You have to continue um, to be creative. But I will say this, this is the first time that I've gone to baseball to a baseball stadium without having any skin in the game as mm -hmm. far as as far as being a player, a coach, a manager, a broadcaster. A, uh, I'm just going as a fan. And just to be able to see not only within the lines, but outside the lines as well and see the fans enjoy it and start singing with them. <laughs> it was it's pretty darn cool <laughs> yeah i you know i know that you were involved in doing some of the recruiting too of of team puerto rico and uh weren't you the guy who convinced marcus stroman who pitched for team usa last time that he should just switch allegiance <laughs> between puerto rico how did you do that man i'll tell you i mean not only did i convince him i convinced also uh michael gibbons as well but uh because they you know Marcus Stroman, let's talk about Marcus. It was his mom's Puerto Rican. Last time he pitched in the World Baseball Classic, he was the MVP of the finals. He beat yeah. Puerto Rico, and he was doing all the shimmy stuff and everything. <laughs> Puerto Ricans knew that his mom was Puerto Rican. Um, last time, Alex Cora was the general manager, recruited him heavily, but then the United States called, and he went to play for the U.S., and so be it that he ends up actually shutting down Puerto Rico. <laughs> The people were upset in Puerto Rico. Or <laughs> social media was it was it was really bad. So I had I called Marcus and you know I told him I texted with him and you know going back and forth and he's like, Well, let's see. 
I had a Sunday night game in San Francisco. It was Cubs, Giants. I also knew that there was a team uh, from Puerto Rico playing in the uh, in the 13 year old Little League World Series in Livermore, California. And Nick Ortiz, who's a coach for the San uh, for the San Francisco Giants, had that team on the field, and there was we were probably an hour and 15 minutes away from game uh, start of the game. And I see Marcus taking ground balls at third base. <laughs> I leave the booth. I run, <laughs> I pull Marcus aside. The little league team is down the line is, is right by the dugout in San Francisco. Marcus is just taking ground balls with, uh, with uh, some, uh, with another teammate of his there. They weren't taking batting practice. It was just defense. He was having fun. I call Marcus over. I'm like, Marcus, Marcus, come over here. I want to, I want you to see something. I want you to meet these kids. I already had spoken to the kids earlier, and I told them about Marcus Stroman and my desire of having him on the team. Little did I know that Marcus's glove has the Puerto Rican flag right where the Rollins mm-hmm. should go, right where, mm-hmm. you know, right where the city has the Puerto Rican flag there. I called him over. I said, these kids want to meet you. He comes over. The kids are like, Marcus Stroman, you're the best, Marcus Stroman. <laughs> And they look at the glove and they're like, wow, Boricua. They're like, hey, World Baseball Classic, come on, you have to pitch for us. You have to pitch for us. I mean, and it was, for him, I, I believe it was really impactful. I know that he's always wanted to honor his mom. I know that there's been so much pride in that. And he's it's got, you know, the flag of Puerto Rico tattooed on him. He's got the glove uh, up there. And he was like, I'm like, Marcus, man, that, you know, there's a spot for you. And we really, in order for us to win, we need you. And I know this is a long story, but then I go back up. I get my my producers calling me, get back in the booth. I get back in the booth. I sit down. And lo and behold, as I sit down, David Cohn, my partner, shows me a tweet that Marcus Stroman said, I'm blessed. <laughs> I'm going to play for Team Puerto Rico. <laughs> World Baseball Classic. And I was like, don't say it yet. Don't say it. <laughs> And it created a frenzy in Puerto Rico. <laughs> All of a sudden, they're like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, I haven't even called like the WBC to ask permission because, <laughs> and all of a sudden, he just said it out there. And I was like, okay, here we go. Let's start the process. <laughs> so, that's the Marcus Stroman story. And, and I'll tell you this, he's been, he's been great. He's, it, it, it's so, I've seen pictures of his mom. I've seen him with his child. There, it's a great experience for him to see the culture and, and how, how uh, I'm so proud of the Puerto Rican people for embracing Marcus, especially after the 2017, um, him, <laughs> him uh, doing what he did to Puerto Rico and that was shutting down the offense. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you about one more thing that I know you were involved in behind the scenes and that is the uniforms. Puerto <laughs> Rico has the coolest uniforms in the whole <laughs> tournament. And let's face it. If you've been watching closely, you know the uniforms are a whole subplot of this tournament because, like, they're falling off guys' uh, bodies. The, the, the letters are falling off their shirts. None of this is happening to your team. What's the story, man? Okay, so the story starts with the first thing is well, the World Baseball Classic is always supplied the uniforms, right, to the team. So you don't have to worry about it. All of a sudden, they're like, this year, you guys are on your own. And we're like, on what? What just happened? <laughs> so I called a buddy of mine in Puerto Rico. And I said, Charlie, Charlie Rom does his name. I said, Charlie, I said, he used to make uniforms and everything. He's got a design company that distributes for a lot. Of, and I said, we have an opportunity here to do something impactful. And I want a uniform that's sort of like the city connects of, <laughs> of uh, you know, that we see in Major League Baseball. I want it to be an island connect. It can be anything. Is there any way you can draw something up that would be just completely different, but we have to stick to the same fonts on the letter, Mm -hmm. on the letterings. We cannot change that. That's part of the Federation. That's a non-negotiable thing. And he came back to me maybe a few days later and he said, I've got a heck of a drawing here. Um, what What do you think about it? And it basically... It's this right here. Let me pull it up. This is actually one of the demos. It still has the t- uh, still has the t- <laughs> uh, ticket and everything on it. And we actually moved we actually moved the sentry box over a little bit. So if you and the original one, it's right here. We moved it over a little bit, 
it's the sentry box in Puerto Rico. It's called La Garita in Spanish. La Garita, it's from San Felipe del Morro. And you see mm. it as a tourist when you come in in old San Juan. It used to protect uh, the island of San Juan, right? Of the island of San Juan. And uh, then you have the waters, the beautiful waters, the mm. waves. And then so below cool. is the deep waters, the deep blue waters. Now, this uniform, Jason and, and Doug, can be used as you've seen it with the white pants, or you can go all blue. They also have the blue pants that have the, uh, to, to keep the deep waters of Puerto Rico going. I think it looks really cool with the blue pants. They have yet to bust those out. Oh. I think it would be intimidating for any team <laughs> to see them with the blue pants. Uh, but it is, um, it shows the strength that Puerto Rico has. It's symbolic to every Puerto Rican. I don't think there's been a teenager that is not, or a student that has not gone in to, uh, from, you know, from all the uh, uh, class trips that you do uh, to, to be able to, you know, go to and, and discover what El Morro is all about. And, and for me, when I saw it, it made so much sense. And when I showed it to the president of the Federation, Dr. Jose Quiles, who had to approve it, um, he was like, I love it. And that was the only time, I, that's all I needed. And I love it. And for me, that was a yes. And I said, okay, let's go with it. And then after that, we had to find quality because I'm like, I don't know anything about uniforms. So I ended up calling a, a, a friend of mine um, and via Orlando Cepeda Jr. and Charlie Stobbs from Adidas, they actually took charge in this and they got us to the right people with Adidas and Adidas has been unbelievable. And they supplied the team, not only with the uniforms, road, home, alternate, you're looking at just all kinds of, all kinds of really cool swag. Um, and the quality is unbelievable. And I'll tell you this, no letters have fallen off. No <laughs> buttons have fallen off. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and they made them all custom made to all the major leaguers as well so it's like it's a perfect fit from what they wear at the major league level yeah like see uniforms matter and we, fa- oh, yeah. we found that out in that great britain columbia game where it's the greatest moment in the history of baseball in great britain and the guy pitching the ninth ian is it gibo is that the right way to pronounce it uh, he is pitching the ninth to close out the first win in WBC history by Great Britain. And the T in great falls <laughs> off his shirt. Really? <laughs> so that's never going to happen with your team, man. Not only that, there are, there are certain, there are craziness. Let me show you guys something. Okay, so the, the WBC rules are nuts. And I've learned so much about uniform, Jason. I think I know more about uniforms now than hitting. It's so great. So th- there's a rule. First of all, the the uh, the brand has to be on this side, on the right side. For some reason, Great Britain, they did it on the left, just like how they drive, right? Before you look left, uh, so they did it on they did it on the opposite side. And not only did they do it on the opposite side. By the way, I got reprimanded for having the Adidas logo a little too big. It's only supposed to be 0.75 cubic inches around. So I got in trouble for that, but you know what? It is what it looks like. It looks like but I say one montagna, right? It looks like a mountain. I know, right? But uh, uh, I think it fits. That's okay. It works well. It works well. And 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 and, uh I'm really proud of of what the players have done. I'll show you another thing that's really cool. Um, I've had to deal with everything. Let me see if I can open this one up. (laughs) So this is actually a prototype, but the belts were made like this and with, with the Puerto Rico. Uh, flag on it as well nice all one my wife actually kept this one but they it's a blue belt with the white and on the end on the original one when you watch the players it'll have a gold 21 it has a gold plated 21 that each player has as well honoring our roberto clemente which we Mm -hmm. uh who we feel is 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 as important as um anything else we have when it comes to our history of the game and um, it, it was a lot of pride to see that first game against Nicaragua where the Nicaraguan people were like, if we're going to lose, we're okay losing to Puerto Rico because of what Roberto Clemente meant to our country as well as he passed um, trying to help out Nicaragua after the earthquake. 
uh, as he was headed there um, in 1971. So for, for us, it's, uh, it's uh, 1972, sorry. For us, it's uh, very important that we, that we honor that and we understand who Roberto Clemente was and, and still is for our island and our people. Yeah, and, and, you know, just thinking about, I know I've spoken quite often about how beautiful experience I had playing in Puerto Rico. And, uh, you know, I was just, I hadn't gotten to the big leagues yet. I had a, a tough time in uh, in AAA. And uh, I was able to go to Puerto Rico and not only play against these amazing players. Yeah, the dream team was around, Edgar Martinez and Juan Gonzalez, Roberto Alomar, Delgado, Rodriguez. I mean, it was Bernie. It was just endless. But um, but it was more than just learning on the field. It was just how the people embraced me as like a son. And uh, it was really powerful because it was it completely changed my career. I mean, it changed my career because I was struggling to kind of get to what, what the expectation was of being this first round draft pick. And as you know, we were drafted the same year in the first round. So we had this sort of parallel story. But it was transformational for me, and and just how the, the families of Puerto Rico took me in and embraced me, uh, which I imagine Mark and Stroman feels very well too. So I just know that you know, listening to the fact that Nicaragua, other countries see this this fusion of of uh, humanity together in Puerto Rico is, makes you know it, it connects the dots for me. So I just um, saying that more out of an appreciation than a question. But I know that people feel that culture. And I know just players that, uh, you know, Marcus, who's not, you know, who's played for the U.S. and has this choice. That was sort of like me being Trinidadian in my history and coming over and being able to realize, like, wow, this is something special. And that that culture is is really magical. It really is. I mean, I can go back. My parents are both Cuban. They met in Puerto Rico. My, do- my dad's an adopted uh, native of Puerto Rico. Um, and... You know, I take pride in being able to say that I have the best of all three flags. You know, mm-hmm. with Cuban blood, raised in with all with 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 the the sense of of understanding what a Puerto Rican is all about, and feeling very Puerto Rican, and at the same time born in the United States. I was born in Cincinnati, so being able to to embrace all three, and knowing that the red, white, and blue, in any order for me is important. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's something that has, for me, it's, it's so much pride to be able to, uh, uh, to be a part of And You and I went to Cuba and, and, and we spent, we spent a, a unique experience there. As a matter of fact, I can always turn this around and always see Dougie right there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for me, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just a lot of pride to, to understand where, where we're from and who who we are and i think when you go into that stadium at least at lone depot park i sense it i sense it from the venezuelan fans from the cuban uh from the cuban fans that are watching this game wondering if team cuba who's one win away guys team cuba's one win away from coming to little havana and playing in lone depot park that's a story in itself uh that's a rich history in itself. And whoever gets it right is going to knock it out of the ballpark because this year they're going in with two current major leaguers, former major leaguers, and with players that are playing in the minor leagues and are still playing in Cuba and in Japan. And I think it's going to be an interesting dynamic to see how the people um, and the older folks that had the, you know, this is, a, this is the Cuban diaspora is here in Miami. I think that's that's going to be another a complete different beast if that ever happens. Wow, that that is that is something to think about. Let, let me ask you about Team USA before we let you go. Uh, you know, Ken Rosenthal wrote an excellent piece in the Athletic this week about all the restrictions on the usage of pitchers that Mark DeRosa is operating under as he tries to manage that team in the first round and can he pose the question if we're going to force this team to operate this way why even bother to participate i wonder how you would answer that question the dominican republic is forced to do it the same way so is puerto rico so is venezuela edwin rios uh edwin diaz finished edwin that diaz. one inning yesterday and then was able to come back for the next inning I don't think the pitchers no, no, no. can do that. 
at, he didn't come back. He threw that one inning and he was done. Okay. And he can't throw back to back days. Okay. Uh, so there, there are there are restrictions all over. Alexis Diaz has the same restrictions. Um, you have a lot of pitchers that have the same restrictions in the Dominican Republic. It's the same way. Okay. I just think that that's that's part of the art of configuring your roster. They they went from twenty eight to thirty. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. The the the, op, the the availability and the amount of of players that d in this case, because he was the manager, just like Le- Jimmy Leland uh, was the manager before, that they have to choose from. You can go all all-stars if you want, or you can play a complementary type team as you want as well. They increased it from 28 to 30-man rosters. You have the, abil- uh, the availability to try to keep your players healthy. You have a plethora of players that you can use. Um, I just think I think it's I think it's even. I think it's even across the board for a lot of the guys. In Japan, they have different rules for their players. I get it. But they also train earlier. They start their spring training at the beginning of February. Uh, they have they have longer to get ready. They understand what this world baseball classic means. And I think it took a while for the United States to understand what the world baseball classic meant to the rest of the world. It it, it also took a, a United States a time to, to understand because they ended up winning it in 2017 but 2006 2009 it was japan that won it it was korea that went to the finals against japan earlier on um and then in 13 it was the dominican republic there's there's a lot of pride when they win it it the dominican republic they won it in 2013 they all got rings and it was that hand delivered to them by the president of their nation <laughs> right. that, that that tells you how big that event is there um, the United States at the beginning, they were taking it as, well, this is more of like a showcase. You know, this is for the fans. You know, if we win, we win. If we don't, we don't. It's different. It's different when all of a sudden you can't turn it on and turn it off. And if you know that you have those restrictions, before you make that roster, you have to consult the organizations and say, how, how can we use this guy? Um, I was surprised when I saw Tim Anderson at second base yesterday. I'll give yeah, you a great example. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if the White Sox knew that he was going to be playing second base. Would he have got, you know, did he did he consult the White Sox before Tim Anderson went to second base or not? That remains to be seen. But those yeah. things you also you have to cover them. When I was a general manager of the team, I called, I emailed every general manager. I said, look, this is what I have. Um, a great case, and I'll give you a great example, Von Grissom. Mm-hmm. Mom yeah. is from Aguas, Puerto Rico. Von Grissom, I notified them around August of last year. They're like, look, he has a chance of being our shortstop next year. We don't sign Dansby Swanson. We'd love to have him in camp the entire time. So I kept him off the roster. Mm -hmm. Why put him on if you have Francisco Lindor, you have Javi Baez, and you have Carlos Correa there. They're going to play different positions. We have to ask permission to Correa's camp. You have to ask permission to the Detroit Tigers as well. You play at second base. If they say yes, then you go on. If they say no, you have to be creative on how you can use your players. Same thing with George Springer. Parents, one's Panamanian, the other one's Puerto Rican. I recruited him to play for Puerto Rico, but he can only be a DH, can't throw yet. So those are the balances that you need to know going in. And if he can't, if they can't play, then you need to go to another player. I think that's an excuse, having been in the general manager's position, been in the coaching position, and being in the player position, where sometimes you just have to balance that thirty-man roster. Um, I don't think any, I don't think any of the teams are going to be uh, um, feel feel bad for for D Row in USA. That's the reality. <laughs> right. They're going out there to try to beat them, and and you know look at the right. Dominican Republic. Look how, look how they have to use their players. They have a plethora of players. A plethora <laughs> right. of players. Oh, by the way, there's a guy in the Cleveland Guardians, Jose Ramirez, that's not even on the team. <laughs> He's not even on the team. And he's one of the (laughs) players of the game. No doubt. I'm curious, Eduardo, on the flip side of that, do you have any stories around, like, people who came to you or and was like, sorry, I can't take you? I mean, that has to happen too, right? I want to play for this team. I want this honor. And how does that conversation, is it like George Clooney and up in the air? Like, how do you, like, fire someone or or let someone know, like, sorry, there's no room? Okay, so... 
curious thing as you mentioned that i'm going to look on the personal side of it and this was like my list right here right i had a list of players <laughs> oh, right wow. this is my list in june 11th i haven't touched it since june 11th oh, this my was my goodness. list okay <laughs> so i had more than i want to say more than 100 people just to coach they wanted to be a part of the team to coach so hmm. many qualified so many qualified people um i had outfielders that you know that were sending me their resumes i want to be a part of it i don't care uh, I had players. I, a great one was Jose de Leon. Just, you know, perfect for five and a third innings yesterday. He was so, I mean, he's a heck of a pitcher. And I have him on the list. I haven't moved this in. I have him on the list. But the reality was that I needed to know if he was going to be healthy or not. And who was he going to sign with? And does he have a chance of making that big league team or not? All those things play into it. Christian Arroyo is a great example. He wanted to play last year. He said, hey, I'm in. Team Puerto Rico, I'm in. When he told me that, he was a utility player for the Boston Red Sox. All of a sudden, Trevor Story goes down. Christian Arroyo has a chance to be the opening day second baseman and make a name for himself at second base playing every day. He stands to make a lot of money now if he has a great year as a free agent. So, he's you know, he's not on the team. He opted to stay in camp because he doesn't want to be Wally pipped out of there while he's gone. And I yeah. get it. I get it. And those are the things that the stories change. So you have to have a balance with everyone. A lot of players will take it personal, but there are so many that wanted to play that just as a Gran combo would say a salsa group <laughs> in Puerto Rico, one of the most famous salsa groups. Oh, in Puerto I love Rico. Gran combo. <laughs> No hay cama para tanta gente. There's just not. Yeah. <laughs> and you're I just heard that literally the other day. I just listened to that song yeah, literally the other day. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hey, yes. hey, hey, man, I know we've got to let you go. Uh, just one more thing. It sounds like you think Japan is the team to beat. Well, if you're going to look in your crystal ball, what do you think is the final four in my yeah. yeah. Final four? Man, you put it tough on me. <laughs> <laughs> It all, man, it all depends on tomorrow. Can you ask me after tomorrow? No. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> final four. Out of out of the Japan bracket, Japan will be number Japan will be one. I believe Cuba will be in there now as two. I believe the, uh, because they're going to go up against Australia and they have this kid. Rodriguez that has an unbelievable cutter at 97 pitches in Japan and he can neutralize any any big league offense I spoke to Jerkson Profar and he said he had not seen a pitcher like that at the major league level last year um, at all so I take that for uh, uh, you know as, for his word on it on the pool C and D side of it I'm going to go USA is going to prevail they will be in Miami as, uh, and and they will prevail. And wow, you know what? I, I I scratch that, scratch that. I'm I'm going to say it'll be Venezuela looks good this year. <laughs> Venezuela's got some pitching. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with my heart and say Puerto Rico and USA. Okay, oh, so nice. that, that sounds magical to me. I need, I, need to, I need to live in Puerto Rico, too. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got Japan, part about this. Japan Cuba, Cuba, USA, Puerto Rico. That, that's a magical final four. And if it's wrong, you know where to find Eduardo. <laughs> let, let him know just how let's, right he was. Let's put it this way. Let's put it, be in Puerto Rico. Let's put it this way. Whoever wins tomorrow's game between the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico will be there with the U.S. Mm -hmm. That's what I've got. Sounds good to me, man. All right, yeah, Eduardo, it's always so special to visit with you, and especially when you travel to Starkville. <laughs> so uh, this is like your home away from home. Just remember that. Uh, thank you so much, my friend, and good luck to the team and the people of Puerto Rico. Yes, sir. All right. Gracias, mi gente. Okay, it is that time again. It's time for listener trivia, our way of involving you 
our favorite listeners in this show. Um, Doug, this is quite a week. Uh, we got the WBC going. We've got March Madness beginning. We had the Oscars. We got St. <laughs> Patrick's Day. But apparently, uh, judging by our trivia question, we forgot the most momentous day of them all, uh, yes. Pi Day. <laughs> yes. And by that, I don't mean actual pie. Nothing we get to eat. <laughs> it's 3-14, right? March 14th. So it's the actual mathematical pie. <laughs> and if you're still yes. confused, um, I think that's a problem that we can solve by bringing in this week's spe special trivia guest star. It's Dominic Rivers. So Dominic, thanks for joining us. And can you explain? Can you please explain to our listeners why it is such a monumental day, Pi Day? Well, because uh, contrary to, of course, first of all, thank you for having me. I love your show. Uh, contrary to your introduction, even though Pi, the Greek numeral, is spelled P-I, yeah. some people do commemorate the momentous occasion by consuming Pi P-I-E. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm in. Uh, most of your listeners are not getting a visual, but you take one look at me. I've had my share of pie. So I, I think it's, it's a great day. <laughs> and, right. So, yeah, with, with analytics and, you know, the being adjacent to parts of, you know, what I like about baseball, it's, 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 uh, I thought it'd be a good, good uh, time to, uh, to uh, uh, send in a trivia question. Oh, can you tell the listeners uh, what is pi exactly? Like, what's the? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh yeah. So, pi the the number itself is, is uh, approximately three point one four, but there's an infinite number of uh, continued decimals three point one four one five nine, and you know you you get some real nerdy, brilliant people who can recite it, you know, to dozens, hundreds of digits. <laughs> I, I don't go that far, but. The practical use of it is it, it's a symbol in mathematics. It represents the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. So th th that ratio is 3.14159, et cetera. So uh, whoever, I probably should know this, whichever uh, mathematician discovered that probably uh, was, was quite amazed to realize every circle has that ratio. Yeah. Right. Cool. I, I just know I'm I'm personally stuck on the uh, idea that I can now celebrate with a little slice of key lime pie tonight. <laughs> I'm in Port Florida. Florida. It seems like a thing to do. So let's do that. <laughs> really? <laughs> hey, hey, Dominic, I believe this is your first appearance on this show, right? So tell us about yourself, where you're Correct. from. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in Cincinnati most of my childhood and I've lived in Metro Denver most of my adult life. I'm one of those many people that uh, tried a couple careers and failed, and including trying to work in baseball, um, and uh, went to law school in my 30s, and now I'm a lawyer for a construction company here in Denver. Well, great. And, you, you know, you submitted your question via the magic of email. We, we appreciate that. And it's it's really a fun question. I don't know if we'll get it right, but we'll have fun getting it wrong if we don't. So, so Dominic, yeah. this is your chance. Why don't you hit us with your question? Okay, uh, so as I sort of alluded to, um, Pi Day is an annual opportunity for annual for analytical nerds to recite the infinite digits of pi, eat pi, uh, talk to each other about baseball statistics, including the stats of former Baltimore Oriole outfielder Felix Pi. I, I know it's PA. <laughs> don't send no. that email. Um, it, it, so, in observation of Pi Day, here's a question about superstar major league baseball pitchers who retired with less than pi career earned run averages mm -hmm. and the question is as follows there are six hall of fame pitchers who debuted in the major leagues on or after 1970 mm -hmm. so basically the people were somewhat the same age uh grew up watching uh they debuted after 70 who retired with a career era of less than pi Mm -hmm. uh, so again, Hall of Fame pitcher, yep. debuted after on or after 1970, a uh, career ERA of less than one three point one four one five nine, and I have a hint. Uh, Doug Glanville faced three of the six pitchers, and I have his stats against them. If that helps, oh, that definitely helps. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're, we're we're definitely going to take advantage of that. This this is a cool question, but uh, before we dive in, uh, we need to negotiate. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, if you listen to the show, which I know you do, Dominic, you know that six is way above the <laughs> Glanville trivia line. <laughs> he will not provide six answers to any question. So we need to agree on a number where we don't have to come up with all six of these guys. So, all right. So what do you think is fair? Would four be fair? Uh, I think you're going to get, you're going to give okay. Doug hints about three of them. Well, so Unless pie, this episode number of the podcast is, is sponsored by some cruise line and I'm going to win a free cruise. <laughs> if you miss it, then I am happy to accommodate. Uh, how about four of six? Four works for me. What do you think, Doug? Four work for you? Well, I, I thought pi would be an appropriate number. Is there a, a pi number of pitchers? <laughs> well, it's more um, than three. Yes. So I think three. four is the way to go. <laughs> uh, all right. I could work uh, with four. I, uh, especially, yeah, I should be okay on the three, possibly. I'm actually not totally sure uh, on uh, all. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, let, uh, let's let's yeah. do it this way. Since um, Doug, fit, you said face three of these guys, and you've got a hint for all three, we're going to let yeah. Doug go first. Okay? okay, and then I'll try to help as best I can. No pressure. All right. So what? What? All right. So what? Are, what are the hints for Doug? So Doug? okay. So of the the six, the one with the lowest ERA on the list, Doug was zero for one against him with a ground out in nineteen ninety nine. Mm -hmm. Would yep. you? Uh, the uh, next guy, yeah. the guy who pitched the most innings on this list, Doug was wow. one for six with an RBI single in two thousand one. And against another guy, he was quite good on this list. He was three. Remember, this is a Hall of Fame pitcher with an mm. ERA under 3.14. And Doug was three for six, including mm. a triple in 1998. All right. Well, Doug remembers all of his triples. So, Doug, I expect you to get that one. I think I'm pretty good on these, I think. So, all right. So, number the first one is Mariano Rivera because – I faced him once and that's all I needed to see that <laughs> fastball that he had was, I was just happy to put it in play. So that one, that was ridiculous. Um, the next one, I'm pretty sure is Pedro Martinez because I got a base hit off him to actually we beat him, which was in 99, I think, or what year is it? 2001? 2001. Yes, sir. Okay. So it wasn't 91. So yeah, I think it was Pedro Martinez. At least I know I was one for something off him and he got <laughs> a base hit. Um, then the last the one, the triple, I didn't think I was this good against him. That's what the three for six is kind of throwing me off. Uh, so that, I'm a little worried about that one. I know I was, I know I, I hit two. Trevor, Trevor Hoffman is one who I did get a triple off of. I was kind of surprised that I was three for six. I know I got a couple hits off him. So that, that's the only one I'm not sure about. Um, I know it was at Qualcomm Park. So it was, you know, way before Petco and all that. Uh, so, you know, I'm trying to, you know, triples 90, uh, well, 90 so, I, I, okay, well, all right. I mean, you can't really help me on this one, right? <laughs> so, I, well, I, I don't remember you getting any triples off Trevor Hoffman, but I do know that this is not a question where it says Hall of Fame starting pitchers. It's Hall of right. Fame pitchers and relief pitchers always have lower ERAs than starters. Right. So Mariano and Trevor Hoffman have to be two of them. They have to yeah. be. And then Pedro was awesome. And so I'm, I think Mariano, think, Pedro, and Hoffman have to be three. Then we just need to I mean, come up with a fourth. We can well, do this, Doug. That. All right. Um, so let's think of our choices. Um, like the, the, I mean, the two guys who were the most awesome from this time period are Maddox and Randy Johnson. They might both be on the list. Right, but the problem is I face Maddox. It's right. Are you saying, right? Or are those three hints? All the hints, or is that I? Because he said I faced three of them. Well, that's a good he point. Say, right? Correct. The the other three, uh, I did not. Uh, I, I didn't. used Stathead um, from Baseball Reference. Uh, unless I made a mistake, oh, I should. don't believe I don't believe you you got a hit off these other three guys. Right. So now I faced Maddox like fifty times. So it's it's not him. Okay. Which is shocking, <laughs> but maybe he was bad early in his career. I guess. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, so you're so you're thinking that Maddox is not on the list, Doug? Well, he's if the if the conditions he gave us these three hints, and he hmm. said I fa I faced these guys, but he I, it's it's implied that I didn't face any of any of the other ones on that list. Otherwise, he would have given us the stats. So if that's the case, that's just, then the three other guys I didn't face at all. So that eliminates my entire era 
of, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe there's some American League pitcher I didn't face. I, I can't, I don't think so. I didn't face, like, I didn't face Clemens officially. Well, he's not I the Hall of Fame, him. though. But what right, about, he's not the Hall okay, of Fame, what right. about Randy? You must have faced Randy. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I faced him a million times. A and you must have, okay, see, we know you faced Randy. We know you faced Pedro. We know you faced Maddox. Glavin. Faced I faced Trevor. Smoltz. I faced right. Trevor. I faced Martinez. I faced, I mean, Mike he, Messina, is he in the Hall of Fame? I faced him. He's in, yeah, he's in. He was, um, he was my year. Yeah. The other the other name, since you since he went 1970, the other name I was thinking, again, like if you think about relief pitchers, is Dennis Eckersley. Now, he didn't spend his whole career I faced him. I thought about that. I faced him a lot. He was in Montreal. He, was, he pitched forever. Dennis yeah. Eckersley was never in Montreal. Oh, oh no! I'm saying Dennis Martinez. That's right. No, I faced Eckersley. I faced him. <laughs> I already, I did. You did. St. Louis. Oh right, right, right. When you first came up. All right. So now I'm okay. It now I'm confused about the hint. It's not well, that many. We get, do we get it's clarification? Not that many Hall of Fame pitchers. And I, I, w- I will confirm that it was not. It was intended to be more than implied. I do not believe Doug Glanville faced these other three pitchers. Okay. Wow. So they would so they would have come along before you. All right. So now I gotta rethink this. Um Jim Palmer's career started yeah. before nineteen seventy. Right. What Steve Carlton. The, what right. was the he was started in the sixties. What about Tom Seaver though? Seaver is on my list. Was, Se- was Seaver's first year well, is, is he on, or was he on the sixty nine Mets? Uh I, I have Luis Tiant. What about Tiant? Now it started before that. Goose, um, Goose Gossage. Is he not in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Goose is in the Hall. But Goose okay. is... Ooh, Goose is a good guess, man. When did Goose... Uh, I think Goose... I think Goose is a great guess. I love that. I think uh, Goose is a... I think Goose... I mean, that's a... That's a dominant Hall of Fame reliever whose career probably started just in that range. I like that guess. All right. Any other relievers? Willie Hernandez? Is he in the Hall? No. Okay. Uh, Mariano uh, Hoffman. Catfish Hunter. When did he start pitching? He started in the 60s. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. Palm. Don, Don Sutton. What year did he start? Uh, he would start in the 60s. And I don't think he has any area under 3 1 4. Yeah. So let, all right, let's hone in on this now. Mariano Hoffman Goose. Pedro Martinez. And, and Pedro. All right. I, I think it, that's. That it's seems like, shocking. like a good guess to me. We're it's thrashing, shocking. though. We're thrashing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like there's no pitcher who has under three ERA in the Hall of Fame, under three point one five, and uh, it, that's that's like amazing. Six. <laughs> and there's six of them. Who are we missing? We must like we did we mention it? Um, you know, like, what are we you know, the thing about Randy is he hung on a long time. Maddox hung Richard. on a long time. And it, you know, it kind of pokes their ERAs back, back above I mean, three one right, four. We're, for it, we're doing this on the top of our head. All right, the people listening. Well, all out right, here. give me give me a Cy Young list. Like, can we think Cy no. Youngs of eighties? This is not like, Cy Youngs. This is Hall of Fame. I know, but just like the best pitchers of the eighties. Who are these guys? John Tudor, Mar- uh, Mar- uh, Mar- No, they're not in the Hall Mar- of Fame. They are know, not but, in the Hall of Fame. Um, I since I Hall go fame, to Cooperstown 80s. every July. I'm okay. familiar with who's in the Hall of Fame. Right, so I, who's in the I, Hall of Fame from the okay, 80s? Okay, so I think I think our guesses are pretty clear. It's the relievers. It's Mariano, Trevor, and Goose. And then pick one of those starters who you faced. That's the, Pedro. I, I got the... the Pedro. That's, that's, okay, so let's let's do that. But I know. All right, we're going to do that. No, but I, we I, should I, just guess. There's no, Before 80s, you talk us out of it. I, who are the... Okay. I, I'm just amazed there's no Hall of Famers that pitched in the 80s that were this good. Like, who, well, who are these? Nobody that had this good of an ERA in the 80s. Uh, had to be somebody. The 80s. Like, 90s. Recognize like, now that Jack Mark. Like the, the, yeah, the 80s are Steve. a very underrepresented decade in general. And the pitchers of the 80s. You're on. You're on top of this. Is that uh, Jack Mars, Doug, uh, Dave Steve, um, yeah, that like that group Fernando, that came Malta. along that's it started in the in the eighties. You know the great pitchers of this of the eighties, Carlton Seaver, those guys. They started in the seventies and the sixties. 
Yeah. We're like you're you're trying to talk us out of all right, all right, the right, right answer. <laughs> Don't well, do I, that. I just, all right, all right. I'll get the answers after. I'm very curious about like Mickey Lulich or someone like that. <laughs> He's like, not in the Hall of Fame. He's all right, not. All right, all right. All right. Um, I'll I'll just concede. I just okay, I'm a little... okay. So I I think we've decided that we're gonna or that, that we're gonna answer Mariano, Trevor, Goose, Pedro. You guys yeah. are amazing. Yep. We, did we get this right? Yes, we did. We got it right. <laughs> we did. I don't know even how we got there, but we somehow got it right. And so, okay, so who are the other two, Dominic? So Pedro was the only starter. Uh, there were there were 15 Hall of Famers that um, debuted on or after, Hall of Fame pitchers debuting on or after 1970. 14 relievers. I'm so, sorry, that's not true. All of the starters save Pedro Martinez had ERAs over Pi. So the two guys you didn't get were Lee Smith and uh, uh, Bruce Suter. Uh, Bruce Suter. Yep. Mm. Wow. Okay, I thought that yeah. both of those guys had had their ERAs drift above Pi. But at any rate, we did this. <laughs> you, you did. Oh it, yep. This is Amazing. good work by us. It, it, <laughs> like it sounded bad, but we got there. We're three for three this spring, Doug. Three for three. Amazing. Our OPS is now what? Uh, I bet 8,000. Three billion. Let's throw a yeah. number out there. Let's we'll throw a number out there. <laughs> I can't get us out, even though it seems like you can. Uh, like, here's the best news of the day. Uh, our work here is done. Which means <laughs> it's time for the best part of this segment, which obviously is the part that does not involve us. It's the part where we bring in the mayor of Starkville, Tim McMaster, to play some incredible play-by-play clip involving this week's answer. So, Tim, what do you got for us, my friend? Good job, guys. I love that Doug actually came up with the final, like, correct uh, answer and then tried to talk you out of it. <laughs> Usually one two... of you gets the answer, the other one talks them out of it. But he right. did on this, this is two shows in a row where I just step in and say, no, you're overthinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent job. Uh, there was only one starter on the list, really, Pedro, obviously. So we're going to go with Pedro. I think we may have used this clip a while back, but it's so good. How come we, you didn't pull the clip of me getting a hit off him? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it doesn't fit the, it doesn't fit the question, Doug. Sorry. Right. Uh, anyway, uh, of Pedro's great seasons, all of them, obviously, but but 99 and 2000 are the two that really stand out. The 207 ERA in 99, followed by the 174 in 2000. This is 1999, September 10th at Yankee Stadium. Here at Yankee Stadium. Another strike count, and that will uh, create a high for Pedro Martinez with 17 strikeouts. Man. In 1999, you talk about domination. He allowed only one base hit, a home run by Chili Davis to the second inning, and from that point on, he got mad. 22 <laughs> in a row retired to finish the game. I love that he got mad. Uh, yeah, I go, that is great. He got mad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, could, could you hear the crowd noise? Could you hear the buzz in that place? No, there was nothing like watching Pedro, just one of the most charismatic pitchers of all time. Seriously, and at no. Yankee Stadium, the buzz. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there was right? a good amount of Red Sox fans there. <laughs> yeah, good, good guess. Hey, anyway, Dominic, what a great mathematically correct question. Mm-hmm. We loved it. Love, and we love to have you question. join us here in Starkville. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. You guys enjoy your pie. All right. <laughs> we'll Absolutely. A de- a authorized to eat pie. What could go wrong? <laughs> you know, you too can be part of these trivia segments just like Dominic. We'll tell you how to do that in just a few minutes. Sliding, catching, and going into the dugout. Hey, you know what we're going to do now? We're going to take another trip to the dugout. Uh, That's where Doug Glanville hangs out and entertains us with his own inimitable brand of baseball storytelling. (laughs) And Doug, you know, we've talked about a lot of different stuff through the years. I always love your spring training stories. So uh, I'm going to just lean back now and let you spin some tales. So just what is on your mind today as you think back (laughs) about your time in spring training? Yeah, I mean, well, Jay, I've been reminiscing quite a bit because this past week I was in Mesa, Arizona, covering the Cubs at their Sloan Park facility, which is gorgeous. And uh, I got to see the uh, the Dodgers, the Cubs White Sox, the Cubs Brewers. And uh, it's funny because whenever I get to, you know, back to Mesa for these spring training 
uh, games the last couple of years, I reminisce about my time there because in 1991, I was drafted by the Cubs. And once uh, I signed, they sent me this gigantic promotional video plus, or they played a video and they, with uh, Jim Fry was the GM, I think at the time. And we also had a packet that was kind of giving us a welcome to the Cubs. So uh, I later found out that it was, it was full of a um, little bit embellishments on the uh, the conditions that I'd be arriving in for spring training. <laughs> so they, they sold it though. Like, oh, they, oh, this video is like, I'm a Cub. This is amazing. So I get the pamphlet and I'm opening it. And I remember a couple of lines. One was uh, the facility, which is Fitch Park, the workout facility, is four short blocks from the hotel, the, the luxurious Maricopa Inn. So I'm like, okay, luxurious. That's, you know, whatever. I'm sure they use a different word, but we were excited. And uh, provide the, the the program will be providing a hearty breakfast every day. Now, you don't say that to a breakfast person who gets up every morning and makes like a stack of French toast, bacon, eggs. Like every day, I make it for my kids. I am very serious about breakfast. You, you have to use that word very carefully. If it's going to be a continental <laughs> breakfast, like my daughter to this day is offended by a continental breakfast. She she finds it disturbing and dishonest. Th that's her words. So <laughs> that's where we're coming from. The Glanvilles do not play on breakfast. Okay, so, so hearty breakfast. What exactly breakfast. was the hearty breakfast that uh, they served you? You know, those little boxes of Rice Krispies. That, and, and it was one of those, it was like kind of the toastable waffles that wasn't Eggos. It was some knockoff company like, Tegos or something. I had, a, I mean, it was made out of plastic. That so, I, and the day that I went in and got disappointed by this was uh, we had to do what they call this run, where you run in a group of like five around the perimeter of the outfield, and then the person at last place has to sprint to the beginning and then go around again. We Texas, we call it the Ranger Run or whatever. That was, uh, you know, I was completely passing out because all I had was Rice Krispies. Come on. Glanville needs like a stack of pancakes. So I didn't believe them after that. But let's back up to the actual Maricopa Inn. The Maricopa Inn was a hotel that, you know, may it rest in peace. The panels were falling off from like the 30s. Uh, the carpets were like 35 different colors. You couldn't see anything because probably knew, Lord knows what was on the, the carpet. The air conditioning unit in the wall was banging the sound like all, all night long like in your head, ga, 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 ga. so I remember, so, well, then I, so when I walked in the room, keep in mind the minor leagues, we have roommates. Okay. I don't know this guy from a hole in the wall. It's like first day of college. Like, who's this dude? It turns out this guy was a sleepwalker. Okay. So, <laughs> so the first night, you know, I'm laying in my bed, you know, I'm trying to sleep, whatever. And this banging ga, 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 air conditioning, whatever. And I'm laying down and all of a sudden I hear him get up, me go to the bathroom, whatever. And he, he comes back and he's kneeling on the floor between our two beds. And I thought he was looking for something. And I hear him talking to, oh, get that off the kit, kit, Calton. What are you doing? Move that. He's like yelling at somebody, getting in some dispute. I don't know if it's his wife. or. I, so I'm like, I'm talking to him thinking he's awake and he's completely in a like trance. So I'm like, all right. So I'm now I'm like, I have one eye open. I'm kind of sleep, trying to sleep. And then um, he gets up from his kneel and he tries to get in my bed. So I was like, what is going on? <laughs> so of course, now I have a bat that I, I'm keeping with me. And that, I mean, I had to sleep with a bat. Like, well, who's this? I don't know this guy. So yeah, it was, it was crazy. So that was my first night of minor league spring training. First night he tries to sleep, he sleepwalks into my, tries to get in my bed. So I switch beds. He gets in my, <laughs> I just jump in the other bed. So like this, this is already creepy. So that's how it started. So then I'm like, oh, okay, no worries. It's just four short blocks to the facility. Well, I grew up in outside of New York City. All right. Four short blocks are four <laughs> short blocks. They're like 20 <laughs> blocks to a mile. So I can see the four short. Arizona, that's like four states. That's four <laughs> states. I was like, what? Where is the ballpark? I'm, what are you talking about? I'm counting the little blocks in between. They're like, no, no, no. Four Phoenix blocks. So I was like, okay, this they're just lying right at this point. All right. So you and then Arizona in spring training in February, or I think it's March at this point, it's kind of cold in the morning. So I'm going in like, man, this is Arizona. It's like freezing out here. So I'm I'm like bundling up. But then you walk back at noon, it's 136 degrees. So I'm like <laughs> shedding layers and like and you don't really sweat. You kind of like 
you know, you, you kind of, it, it evaporates as soon as it leaves your skin. So I remember I was a little bit overconfident at the extra melanin in my skin. I was like, I don't need sunblock. I don't need zinc oxide. What are you talking about? This skin right here, I, I got built-in melanin. I don't need it. Man, my I look like a Gila monster, like a Komodo dragon after like a week. <laughs> my skin was cracking off. My lips were like on fire. I had to wear like, I, I look like, I had to put on this like white paste just to like survive. And I remember the bumps broke out on my arm. I was like, okay, wait a minute. I got I to gotta tone down the, the overconfidence here. So, I mean, it is a lesson every day. And I just remember like the Maricopa Inn. But the thing is when you, you set the tone for these minor league players that, you know, the bar is is at a level where you're motivated to go up the up the levels, right? You, you want to get out of here, right? You want to get out of the Maricopa. The Maricopa Inn only had nine, fo- only had four phone lines going out. So you had to go. And if you hit nine, that's how you got out. But if four people were on the phone, you couldn't get out. It was a busy signal. So most times your family would call and, and you'd see the red light and you have to check your message because that was it. So you were motivated. So at this point, my mentality had been so beat down. It was like pre- pledging that when we I got moved up to the Best Western <laughs> Hotel at Double A, I thought I had been. I thought I was at the Four Seasons. I was like, "This is amazing! I'm at the Best Western. I have my own room." I mean, that's what you do to these guys. <laughs> so, so yes, it's motivating, and uh, I have great memories of like my teammates and going to movies and going to like Jack in the Box, and uh, and having a, a good old time. And then finally. It all culminated when I finally made the major league roster. I was in the best Western, had my own room, and I look up and Ryan Sandberg's jersey is hanging next to mine. Uh, and I was like, okay, I, I know I'm not in the big leagues yet, but I've kind of made it. And now it's time to get serious. So, so um, it does end well in, in some did. fortunate cases. And I know many of my teammates, all the respect in the world, because I know most people don't, don't get there. But I know... Uh, I'm still thankful for all the memories they provided. Yeah. So um, hearty breakfast, not exactly. <laughs> Luxurious accommodations, not exactly. Four short blocks, not exactly. Um, these were the days when the Cubs used to train at Ho-Ho Camp Park. Is that right? Yeah. They Well, they built so, the stadium, but we were, yeah. the minor leagues were at Fitch. Yeah. So ho ho is the, the big right. park. I, I was thinking as you were describing this, they really should have changed that name to Ho 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 Ho. <laughs> right. Right. Just right. kidding. Just kidding about all that. Uh, all right. That's going to do it for this week's show. We'll be bringing you podcast magic just like this all spring training long on the Athletic Baseball Show, which is available in its entirety, absolutely free everywhere you get your podcasts. And by the way, we're now on YouTube, so check us out. Also, if you'd like to read any of the incredible spring training coverage in The Athletic, uh, you've come to the right place. Just go to theathletic.com slash baseball show. And if you're a new subscriber, you can subscribe for just $1.99 a month for the next 12 months. But also remember, you too can be part of this podcast. Every show, we pick some fun listener trivia question. Then that lucky listener gets to join us right here and prove, at least once upon a time, there was no baseball trivia question we can't get wrong. So how could you join us? You could do what Dominic Rivers did today. You can email us at Starkville at theathletic.com. That's Starkville with an E on the end. Or you can hit us up on the Twitter and Doug Lanville can be found on the Twitter. For some reason, I just can't remember where someone could find you on the Twitter, Doug. Well, no longer Mesa, Arizona, but I'm back. Yep. Uh, but it's simple. It's at Doug Glanville, D-O-U-G-G-L-A-N-V-I-L-L-E. And that's it. Doug wins the spelling bee every week. Uh, every you week. can find me at Jason S-T. That's at J-A-Y-S-O-N-S-T. Jason with a Y. Please remember, hashtag those questions, hashtag Starkville QS. So, Doug, thanks for playing. Thanks to Eduardo Perez for visiting us. Thanks to Dominic Rivers for the great trivia question. Thanks to the mayor of Starkville and also the substitute mayor of Starkville. (laughs) That's to McMasters and Cameron Molina for producing us and putting up with us. And thanks to you all for listening. 
Doug and I will see you soon. On oh, Starkville. Oh, my God. Yeah. I thought yeah. we had it. thought we did. Yeah, we had the on right, but that's all right. We're 50% <laughs> of there. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs>